Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to this year's Grotius Lecture, which is generously sponsored by CMS. Thank you very much, CMS. We greatly appreciate your support. Some of you will know uh, that each year there are two Grotius Lectures. One is our own and the other is given under the auspices of the American Society of International Law. In 2008, the American Grotius Lecture was given by High Commissioner Zaid. He was then serving as Jordan's ambassador to the United States. His topic was international criminal law, on which he was particularly well qualified to speak. In September 2002, he had been elected the first president of the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. As such, over the next three years, he played a leading role in converting a paper project into reality. He oversaw the election of the first 18 judges of the court, mediated selection of the court's first president, and led the efforts to name the court's first prosecutor. He had chaired the complex negotiations regarding the elements of the individual offences amounting to genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, a task of particular interest to those of us who've read Philip Sand's recent account of the origin of the first two terms. He went on to pres preside successfully over an even more intractable task, the definition of and jurisdiction in respect of the crime of aggression. High Commissioner Zay did not lack experience on the ground. In 1989, he was commissioned as an officer in the Jordanian Desert Police, the successor to the Arab Legion, in which he served until 1994, when he was appointed a political affairs officer in Nuprafor, serving for two years in that capacity in the former Yugoslavia. From 2000 until 2014, apart from the three years when he was Jordan's ambassador, he was Jordan's permanent representative at the United Nations, where, as advisor to the Secretary General, he produced a comprehensive report on the strategy for eliminating sexual exploitation and abuse in UN peacekeeping operations, and chaired the United Nations Development Fund for Women. High Commissioner holds a Bachelor of Arts from the John Hopkins University and a Doctorate in Philosophy from our own Cambridge University. He has served on many international boards and advisory committees. In 2014, he was President of the UN Security Council and chaired the committees concerned with the sanctions regimes in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Liberia. On the 16th of June 2014, the General Assembly approved his appointment by the Secretary-General as the sixth High Commissioner for Human Rights. He is the first Asian, the first Muslim and the first Arab to hold that office. We are fortunate and privileged that High Commissioner Zaid has agreed to speak to us this evening on Is International Human Rights Law Under Threat? As a member of the Joint Parliamentary Committee, that recommended in December 2013 that this country should comply with its international obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights by giving at least some prisoners the vote, a recommendation that has yet to be implemented, I look forward to his talk with particular interest. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Lord Phillips, uh, Sir Frank, uh, Professor McCorkado, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here uh, to hear you recall some of my biography uh, comes uh, as uh, something very pleasing to me because I've gone through a little bit of an identity crisis and allow me to explain uh, why. Uh, in the UN, there seems to be confusion of my name. Uh, I'm referred to as Al Hussein, Rad Al Hussein, sometimes Zaid Al Hussein, sometimes Alfred Hussein, sometimes just Hussein without any, uh, without any uh, first name. And the other day I was in Brussels 
and uh, a Danish journalist came up to me and uh, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, excuse me, who are you? And I said, you do know I really don't know anymore. <laughs> so uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with all of you. Earlier this month, uh, Britain's Prime Minister called for human rights laws to be overturned if they were uh, to, and I quote, get in the way uh, in the fight against terrorism. Uh, specifically, uh, Theresa May said there was a need, and I quote again, to restrict the freedom and movement of terrorist suspects when we have enough uh, evidence to know they are a threat, but not enough evidence to prosecute them in full in court, end quote. For an increasingly anxious public, uh, shaken by the recent and dreadful terrorist attacks, her remarks no doubt reflected real anger and frustration. But they also seemed, to, uh, in, or seemed intended to strike a chord with a certain sector of the electorate, and it is this expectation that truly worries me. Uh, British officials would probably claim the uh, comments should be understood in the context of a tough electoral campaign and would presumably try and assure us uh, quietly that the government's support for human rights uh, remains uh, steadfast and unchallengeable. Whatever the intention behind her remarks, uh, they were highly regrettable. A gift uh, from a major Western leader to every authoritarian figure around the world who shamelessly violates human rights under the pretext of fighting terrorism. And it isn't just the leaders. A few days ago, citing Prime Minister May's remarks, a former Sri Lankan Rear Admiral delivered a petition to the President of the Human Rights Council. He demanded, and sorry, a few days ago, that's right, citing Prime Minister May, a former Sri Lankan Rear Admiral delivered a petition to the President of the Human Rights Council. He demanded action be taken against my office for forcing Sri Lanka to undertake uh, constitutional reforms and for exerting pressure on them to create a hybrid court to uh, try perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity, when in reality he claimed all they had engaged in was fighting terrorism. My first question, why is international human rights law such an easy target? Why is it so uh, misunderstood? so reviled by some, feared by others, spurned, attacked. My second, if the Prime Minister meant what she said, which universal rights would the UK be willing to give away in order to punish people against whom there is insufficient evidence to justify prosecution? What exactly are the rights she considers frivolous or obstructive? The right to privacy? the right to liberty and the security of person, freedom of expression, freedom of religion and belief, the principle of non-refoulement, the prohibition of torture, due process. And why are we fighting the terrorists in the first place, if not to defend both the physical well-being of people and the very human rights and values the Prime Minister now says she's willing, in part, to sacrifice in order to fight the terrorists. And where would it stop? Forgoing some rights now may have devastating effects on other rights later on. And if we follow this reasoning to its logical conclusion, the e eventual complete unwinding of human rights would transform us, both states and individual, or both states and international organizations. Uh, to quote Nietzsche, Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster, end quote. We, wouldn't, we, wouldn't we would be in danger uh, of becoming virtually uh, indistinguishable from the terrorists we are fighting. So why did uh, Prime Minister May say this? At least part of the answer may lie in market conditions. 
human rights law has long been ridiculed by an influential tabloid press here in the UK, feeding with relish on what it paints as the absurd findings of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Uh, this viewpoint has some resonance with a slice of the public, unaware of the importance of international human rights law, uh, often seen by far too many people as too removed from everyday life, very continental, too loyally, too activist, uh, ultimately too weird. How can the court consider prisoners' voting rights and other supposedly frivolous claims when set against the suffering of victims? The bastards deserve to be punished. Full stop. Now, this may be understandable at some emotional level. However, one should also acknowledge that British ink, reflecting an enormously rich legal tradition, is found throughout the European Convention on Human Rights. And for good reason. To recognize that even a criminal has rights is the basis of enlightened thought, a principle enshrined in common law. It lies at the very core of human civilization and distinguishes us from a primeval horde wrapped only in retribution and cruelties. I believe, like so many others, that criminals too have fundamental rights, because whatever evil they have wrought, they remain human beings. And frequently, their pathological behavior has been influenced by trauma inflicted on them by others. Let me take one perhaps extreme example. In Iraq, there are people who argue for the killing of as many child soldiers of Daesh as possible, and would perhaps even support torturing them, given how monstrous their actions have been. But in Sierra Leone, many child uh, followers of Fode Sanko, who were once hacking off the limbs of other small children, have now largely been rehabilitated, in no small measure due to the efforts of the UN. They were children, even when they were terrorists, and uh, they have to be seen as children first. I seek, in the course of this short lecture, to examine some of these attacks on international human rights law, on international law generally. And you have honored me with uh, the request that I speak to the legacy of, of uh, Hugo Grotius. What would Grotius say today were he to be brought back to life for a few moments? Would he be surprised almost 400 years after the publication of his treaties on the law of war and peace by the overall achievement, the extent of the current backlash, the struggle, or perhaps he would not be at all surprised by any of it. While promoting an international society governed by law, not by force, he may well have been surprised it took a further 300 years of treaty making and immense uh, bloodletting capped by two world wars before humanity embraced a system of international law. Or put another way, reason alone had proven itself to be insufficient. Only the death of some hundred million people in two world wars and the Holocaust could generate the will necessary for a profound change. Humanity had fallen off a cliff, survived, and having frightened itself rigid, uh, became all the wiser for it. The prospect of nuclear annihilation also sharpened post-war thinking. And soon after, the states dropped the UN Charter, reinforced international law, codified international refugee law, further elaborated international humanitarian law, and created international human rights law and international criminal law. It is precisely these bodies of international law that are now endangered. While I ought to in this lecture, sorry, while I ought to in this lecture examine all the threats to public international law, from Russia's seizure and annexation of Crimea to the almost enthusiastic derogation by European powers of their obligations under the 1951 Refugee Convention, or the seemingly deliberate bombing by major state actors uh, of facilities protected under IHL 
such as clinics and hospitals in Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. I shall confine myself for the sake of brevity to those principal threats directed against international human rights law and pay special attention to the absolute prohibition on the use of torture. In doing so, I hope to illustrate how they are symptomatic of a broader cynicism emerging in defiance of international law more generally. Let me first return to the struggle against uh, terrorism and how it is being exploited by governments the world over to roll back the advances made in human rights. The curtailing of the freedoms of expression and association, which uh, threatens to wipe out dissent completely in countries like Egypt, Bahrain, and Turkey, uh, is closing what is left of a democratic space and all under the banner of fighting terrorism. And this contagion is spreading fast. When I emphasize this point and highlight the excesses of government action, I am sometimes accused of showing sympathy with uh, the terrorists, which is outrageous. And I wish to be clear, I condemn terrorism unreservedly. It can never be justified on the basis of any grievance, real or perceived. The Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram manifestation does have a distinct ideology and it must be dismantled at the source. If it is to be fought from a security perspective through intelligence networks and military force, the actions must also be extremely precise. In other words, the arbitrariness and imprecision uh, that are the hallmarks of target selection on the part of the terrorists require a, di a diametrically opposite reaction from states. The laser-like application of the law, consistent with universal human rights standards and guarantees, is the only workable antidote if this struggle is ever to be successful. The detention, and in some cases torture, of individuals whose association with a terrorist group is non-existent, but uh, who are nevertheless charged under a vaguely worded counter-terrorism law, simply because they've criticized the government, is not just wrong, it is dangerous and entirely self-defeating. It transforms not only one individual falsely charged into a person who hates the state, but also their families, friends, possibly even their communities. And some may go further than simply hatred. Arbitrary detention serves the terrorist, not the state. It fuels recruitment. And yet, arbitrary detentions are commonplace in those states grappling with terrorism. In fact, if you believe the rhetoric of many governments, every lawyer or journalist is almost by definition a terrorist, particularly if they are human rights focused, uh, present company included, of course. Moreover, given that uh, prisons, uh, sorry, moreover, given that prisons often become uh, factories for converting petty criminals into violent extremists, the lawful deprivation of liberty ordered by courts should be reserved for the most serious offences and non-custodial remedies sought for lesser offences. This is not what is happening. Instead, we see in the United States a renewed resort to very long prison sentences for those convicted of drug offences. And rather than focus on the potentially violent individuals driven by takfiri ideology or any other extreme ideology, the Trump administration is pursuing its executive orders on the travel bans all the way to the Supreme Court, despite their being struck down as unconstitutional in the lower courts. And we had this uh, hybrid, this is sort of uh, quasi-decision today, uh, which we have to examine. Likewise, in the weeks following the vicious terrorist attacks in Paris in November 2015, the French authorities took broad aim and closed down 20 mosques and uh, Muslim associations while also undertaking some 2,700 uh, 2, warrantless uh, house searches. 
In the United Kingdom, the Investigative, Investigatory Powers Act of 2016 constituted one of the most sweeping mass surveillance regimes in the world, permitting the interception, access, retention, and hacking of communications without a requirement of reasonable suspicion. Refugees and migrants uh, were increasingly viewed as Trojan horses for terrorists. Hysteria raged in political circles across Europe, and the terrorists must have been grinning. When it came to the management of the public's reaction, instead of adopting a common-sense approach, fever set in. To overcome terrorism, governments must be precise in the pursuit of the terrorists. Uh, pretending to seal off borders with or without walls decorated with solar panels is an illusion and a nasty one. Migrant children should not be detained, there should be no uh, refoulement, nor should there be collective pushbacks or decisions taken at borders by police officers instead of judges, or indeed returns to countries that are manifestly not safe. The EU deal with Turkey, in, in our view, has failed on several of these key points, most especially when it comes to the right of every asylum seeker to individual assessment. And taken together with the emergency measures being rushed through a number of European parliaments, which also derogate from the 1951 Refugee Convention, Europe as a sentinel for the observation of refugee and human rights laws worldwide finds itself enmeshed in gross hypocrisy. The demagogues and populists across Europe and in many parts of the world, as well as the tabloids in this country, have for years remorselessly stoked xenophobia and bigotry, the fuel that gave rise to these unwise policies. And this seemed to be paying off with a windfall of popular support gathering in their favour. After the referendum here in the UK, dominated as it was by the whipped up fear of foreigners and foreign institutions, came the outcome of the US election and the populist bandwagon seemed to be on an unstoppable road. The default condition of the human mind is, after all, fear, primordial fear, that innermost instinctive mechanism protecting us from harm, from death, an emotion every extremist, skilled populist included, seeks to tap or stimulate by manipulating it and obliterating deductive reasoning drawn from knowledge they more easily mold the movements they lead and their political ambitions are well served, at least for a while. The emotional mechanism in the mind of a human rights defender works rather differently. To do good in our lives and not just to some but to all, uh, to defend the human rights of all, this requires a continuous investment of thought where the natural prejudices lying deep within each of us must be watched out for and rejected every day of our lives. The default flow in the minds of humanity may be reptilian, but the internal battle to overcome it is profoundly human. To think of all, to work for all, these are, these are the two fundamental lessons learned by those who survived the two world wars, whether we speak in relation to the behavior of states or individuals or states. And they are etched into the UN Charter. The two words, human rights, were not placed in the preamble of the UN Charter by its final author, Virginia Gildersleeve, as a literary uh, flourish. They were written into the text, almost at the beginning, in the third line, because human rights was viewed as the only choice possible for that first beat of a new pulse. Because on the 26th of June, uh, 1945, the day of the Charter's signing, killing on a scale hitherto unknown to humans had only just come to an end, with cities across the world pulverized and still smoking, monuments to immense human uh, malevolence and stupidity. Only by accepting human rights as the cornerstone could the rest of the edifice success in economic development, durable peace, become possible. 
It is a point that even today, perhaps uh, especially today, needs to be absorbed by the numerous political actors who only see human rights as a tiresome constraint. Indeed, many people who have enjoyed their rights since birth uh, simply do not realize what these principles really mean. Like uh, oxygen, uh, they lie beyond our daily uh, sensory perception and only when suddenly deprived of it do we fathom their enormous significance. To advocate for the universal rights of every human being, every rights holder, is another way of saying that only by working together do we as humans and as states have a hope of ridding ourselves of the scourges of violence and war. Tragically, the nativistic reflexes, once again being peddled by populists and demagogues, still seem to work. They sell supremacy and not equality, sow suspicion rather than calm, and hurl enmity against defined categories of people who are vulnerable, easy scapegoats and undeserving of their hatred. This uh, brand of politician seems more intent on profiting from the genuine fear of specific constituencies rather than promoting care, uh, care for the welfare of the whole. Thankfully, ch uh, change is afoot. The populist or nationalist uh, chauvinistic wave in the Western world, which crested in the United States, has broken for now, dashed against the ballot boxes of Austria, the Netherlands and France. There may yet be other waves. Nevertheless, in Europe, the anti-populist uh, movement, as some have called it, is now up and running. In other parts of the world, threats to international law and the institutions upholding them are thus far unaffected by these recent more positive developments. The US is weighing up the degree to which it will scale back its financial support to the UN and other multilateral institutions. It is still deciding whether it should withdraw from the Human Rights Council and there was even talk at one stage of it withdrawing from the core, uh, from the core human rights instruments to which it is party. Uh, last year, it was also reported that nine Arab states, the coalition led by Saudi Arabia, fighting the Houthi Saleh uh, rebels in Yemen, made the unprecedented threat of a withdrawal from the UN if they were listed as perpetrators in the annex of the Secretary General's report on children and armed conflict. The Inter-American uh, Commission for Human Rights, the Inter-American Court, the Southern African Development Court, the International Criminal Court, have also not been spared these threats. Fortunately, in almost all these cases, either the threat of withdrawal has fizzled uh, or fizzled out, or even in one or even if one or two countries did withdraw, no chain reaction ensued. But the regularity of these threats means it is increasingly prob uh, probable that hemorrhaging will occur someday a walkout which closes the book on some part of the system of international law. In this context, most worrisome to me is the persistent flirtation by the President of the United States throughout his campaign and soon thereafter uh, with a return to torture. We are now told the US Army Field Manual will not be redrafted and the US Secretary of Defense is uh, guiding the White House on this. For now, there is little danger of a return to the practice of so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, a, a euphemism that dupes no one. The mood in the US could, of course, uh, change dramatically if the country were at some stage to experience a gruesome uh, terrorist attack and mindful of how the American public has, over the last 10 years, become far more accepting of torture, the balance could be tipped in favor of its practice and destroy the delicate position the Convention Against Torture is in. It is worth recalling that the Convention Against Torture, ratified by 162 countries, is the most unyielding 
of any existing instrument in international law. Its prohibition on torture is so absolute, it can never be lifted, not even during an emergency that threatens the life of a nation. And yet, notwithstanding its uh, broader recognition as Juskogans and the crystal clarity of Article 2 of the Convention, the existence of so many surviving victims of torture who remain unacknowledged, unsupported, denied justice or redress, forms a living testimony to the dreadful persistence of torture worldwide. While only a small number of uh, states appear to uh, practice torture systematically as part of a state policy, 20 countries, and they are listed on our website, do not recognize the competence of the Committee Against Torture under Article 20. Accordingly, they refuse a priori uh, any uh, scrutiny of the alleged widespread violations. A much larger number of states are a host to isolated or not so isolated acts of torture and ill treatment. Disturbingly, states in this group are simply not taking their obligations seriously enough. The levels of impunity are very high, given that most of those individuals who are found culpable uh, face only administrative sanctions and so-called evidence obtained on the torture remains in many uh, states uh, admissible in court. There are also a number of states, and this group may possibly be increasing, which, while having no record of practicing torture, are nevertheless acquiescing to it by, for example, disregarding the principle of non-refoulement as contained in Article 3 of the Convention. Another large majority of state parties uh, also fully or partially disregard their obligations under Article 14 of the Convention for the redress and rehabilitation of victims, no matter where the torture occurred or by whom it was perpetrated. Eleven years ago, noticeable progress was made with the entry into force of the optional protocol which enables preventive visits to be made by the uh, Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture to any place of deprivation of liberty at any time. Some 50 national preventive mechanisms have been created and the Subcommittee has conducted 54 visits. However, many national preventive mechanisms are under-resourced and not empowered to deliver real results. The fragility of the Convention is underscored by the fact that no country abides by all of its terms. No country would admit publicly that it engages in torture. But abundant uh, evidence shows that torture is systematically practiced by at least some states, that first category I referred to earlier. It would seem all governments have been participating in a theatrical uh, pretense of conforming with the Convention. And this may be more crucial than we initially realized because it implies a sense of shame. Consider the alternative. The President of the Philippines has spoken openly about extrajudicial killings. And the President of the United States has said that torture could be necessary in certain circumstances. There is no longer any pretense. They are breaking long-held taboos. If other leaders start to follow the same rhetorical course, undermining the convention with their words, the practice of torture is likely to broaden, and that would be fatal. The convention would be scuttled and a central load-bearing uh, pillar of international law removed. The dangers to the entire system of international law are therefore very real. And today, the 26th of June, is the International Day in support of victims of torture. And earlier, I participated in a panel at uh, King's College organized by the International Bar Association 
to raise awareness about the absolute prohibition of torture and the need for the legal profession to take a far more active role in preventing its use. Human progress never glides. It will always stagger and sometimes even temporarily collapse. The common effort for a common cause within a common frame of understanding and regulation will always be attacked by those more committed to the pursuit of narrower personal or national interests. These extreme practitioners of the assertive thin agenda are apt to dismiss many of today's international laws and post-war institutions as anachronisms. And because to the non-lawyer the system of international law is so complicated, the human rights system is so indecipherable to many laypersons, it is hard to rally the general public who may not see any immediate threat to themselves. And this brings me to the central threat to human rights today. Indifference. The indifference of a large part of the business community worldwide who would still pursue profit even at the cost of great suffering done to others. The indifference of a large segment of the intelligence and security community for whom the pursuit of information eclipses all the rights held by others and who describe challenges to terrible discriminatory practices as treachery. Some politicians for whom economic, social and cultural rights mean little are indifferent to the consequences of economic austerity. They view human rights uh, only as an irritating check on expediency, the currency of the political world. Uh, for others, indifference is not enough. Their rejection of the rights agenda is expressed in terms replete with utter contempt for others, a parade of meanness. Our world is dangerously close to unmooring itself from a sense of compassion, uh, slowly becoming not only a post-truth, but also a post-empathetic world. It is so hard for us now in the UN to generate the sums needed uh, for humanitarian action worldwide. Uh, our appeals for funds for the most destitute are rarely met at levels over 50%. The final figure is often far less. What's happening to us? My hope lies not primarily with governments, but with uh, those people who reject all forms of terrorism, reject extreme uh, discriminatory counter-terrorism, and reject the populisms of the ideological outer limits. My hope lies with those who choose to elect more enlightened political leaders. My hope also lies with the most courageous of us, the human rights defenders, often victims of violations themselves who, armed with nothing beyond uh, their minds and voices, are willing to sacrifice everything, including seeing their children and families, losing their work, even their lives, to safeguard rights, not just their own, but the rights of others. And how stunningly beautiful is that? I am moved by them. We should all be. It is they who ensure we retain our equanimity. It is they, not us, who bear the greater burden of defending this crucial part of our system of international law. It is they who will save us, and in turn we must invest every effort in protecting them. I don't think Grotius would be surprised by any of this. The reptilian urge of the human brain is not easily overcome and humanity will for centuries remain untrustworthy and unreliable. Our behavior and the behavior of states will long require legal scaffolding to keep what we recognize as human civilization in place. Grotius would be grateful we're still fighting, standing up for his international society and perhaps even crack a wry smile when thinking just how prescient he was those uh, four centuries ago, and he may well demand repayment. He was, after all, a great Dutchman. I thank you very much for your attention.